in a land so far away I can't really even conceive of it, so I'm going to grab some peasants and my horse, and I'm going to go. So I'm going. So I'm gone. So goodbye. Welcome to McBurdo's expedition into the unknown and terrible. We have been stuck here in the ice for an eternity. Come into the captain's cabin and warm yourself before you head back out onto the decks. Welcome to my cabin. How long have we been trapped in this infernal ice pack? Or in the summer, tropical estuary. Writers can embellish on a story that they've heard, but hearing the words of someone who actually witnessed an event, sometimes shocking, always amazing. I have not read this before, so we're going to experience it together. I'm going to break in with my opinions. Chances are, as you are a crew member of the HMS Miser, you are not easily upset by the dark and terrible. I will warn you now that these may not have the most politically acceptable ideas or language because they come from the past and things were different then. Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to go back, 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 back to 1095. So a thousand years. Uh, I think this will be our oldest one yet. We are going to listen to the words of the Gesta Francorum Jerusalem Peregrinantium, a history of the expedition to Jerusalem, the Latin chronicle of the First Crusade by Fulcher of Chartres, uh, who was a priest who participated in the crusade and he wrote about it. We're actually going to do a section of what is usually called the Gesta that talks about the conditions in Europe at the beginning of the Crusades because the religious reasons aside, what made them go? If you think of how dangerous Europe was in 1095 and you think that yeah they all just hopped on their horses and <laughs> walked from mostly France to the Holy Land, to fight. Why did they do that? I mean, obviously, I, I understand all the religious reasons, but why would they do that? Now, uh, as some of you know, I have been a Pellegrina, so I do, I do understand doing some things in the name of religion. I didn't actually do it in the name of religion until I was on it and then it changed a bit not in the way it would seem i will shut up now but still i i find it really interesting to just go yeah this happened in a land so far away i can't really even conceive of it so i'm going to grab some peasants and my horse and i'm going to go so i'm going so i'm gone so goodbye so here we're going to talk about the conditions at the beginning of the crusade. Maybe it will tell us and explain. Fulcher, Fouché. We will go with Fouché because it sounds more Franzosish. In the year of our Lord, 1095. Maybe I should say in the year of our Lord, 1095. I love it when things say in the year of our Lord. I just think it's so grand. I mean, you can say, yeah, it's 2022. Or you can say, in the year of our Lord, 2022. In the year of our Lord, 2022. <gasps> it's suddenly grand. It could be the year of Our Lady. It could be the year of the universe. I, I'm not pushing any religious, except those are Christian dates. Damn you, colonialism. In the reign of the so-called Emperor Henry in Germany, and King Philip in France. Oh, Fauché is, he's not biased. Throughout Europe, evils of all kinds waxed strong because of vacillating faith. Oh, now we know why this happened, don't we? Don't we? Pope Urban II then ruled in the city of Rome. 
He was a man admirable in life and habits. Oh, so he wasn't doing bad things that popes could do, like killing and murder and women and men who always strove wisely and energetically to raise the status of the Holy Church higher and higher. But the devil who always desires man's destruction and goes about like a raging lion seeking whom he may devour, stirred up by the confusion of the people of a certain rival to Urban, Wil Wibbert, I was going to say, Wilbert, but no, he's Wibbert, by name, incited by the stimulus of pride and supported by the shamelessness of the aforesaid emperor of the bar- oh. <laughs> I'm going to hell. I was about to say barbarians, but actually it was the Bavarians. Sorry, Bavaria. Ich bin ein Bose Auslander. Wibbert attempted to usurp the papal office while Urban's predecessor Gregory, that is Hildebrand, was the legitimate pope. And he thus caused Gregory himself to be cast out of St. Peter's. So the better people refused to recognize him because he had acted thus perversely. After the death of Hildebrand, Urban, lawfully elected, was consecrated by the cardinal bishops and the greater and holier part of the people submitted in obedience to him. Wibbert, however, urged on by the support of the aforesaid emperor and by the instigation of the Roman citizens, for some time kept Urban a stranger to the church of St. Peter. But Urban, although he was banished from the church, went about throughout the country reconciling to God the people who had gone somewhat astray. What is somewhat astray? Webert, however, puffed up by the primacy of the church, showed himself indulgent to sinners, and exercising the office of Pope, although unjustly, Amongst his adherents, he denounced as ridiculous the acts of Urban. I love it when you have like Pope versus Pope, because this is not the only time in history that we had a little Pope versus Pope action. Can't have to, it just doesn't work. But in this year in which the Franks first passed through Rome on their way to Jerusalem, Urban obtained the complete papal power everywhere with the help of the most noble matron, Matilda by name, who then had great influence in the Roman state. Ah, cherchez la femme. Wiebert was then in Germany. Bing! Go away. So there were two popes, and many did not know which to obey, from which counsel should be taken, or who should remedy the ills of Christianity. Some favored the one, some the other. But it was clear to the intelligence of men that Urban was better, for he is rightly considered better, who controls his passions just as if they were enemies. Uh -huh. I feel the bias. Because you know, there's like Pouche, adherent of Weebert, who's going, yeah, that Urban. Ugh. So intellectual, thinks he's so great, has no common touch. Five high. Webert was the archbishop in the city of Ravenna. Oh, Ravenna is one of those places in Italy I haven't been, which there's a list of them, but I kind of meant to get there and I was kind of like, uh, 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 more time in Rome, go to Ravenna. More time in Rome for the third time, uh, go to Ravenna. I went to Rome for the third time because I love Rome. But now I see Ravenna and I'm like, oh, I should have gone to Ravenna. He was very rich and reveled in honor and wealth. It was a wonder that such riches did not satisfy him. Oh, he's not good enough to be Pope because he's greedy. Greedy! Ought he to be considered by all an exemplar of right living, who, himself a lover pomp, boldly assumes to usurp the scepter of Almighty God? Truly, this office must not be seized by force, but accepted with fear. What? wonder that the whole world was a prey to disturbance and confusion. For when the Roman Church, which is the source of correction for all Christianity, is troubled by any disorder, the sorrow which is communicated from the nerves of the head 
to the members subject to it, and these suffer sympathetically. This church, indeed, our mother, as it were, at whose bosom we are nourished, by whose doctrine we are instructed and strengthened, by whose counsel we are admonished, was by this proud Webert greatly afflicted. Maybe he's Webert. Vibert? Vibert? Webert. Oh, I'm going to hell. For when, anyway, no doubt whose side Fulcher is on, Fauché. For when the head is thus struck, the members at once are sick. If the head be sick, the other members suffer. Since the head was thus sick, pain was engendered in the enfeebled members. For in all parts of Europe, peace, goodness, faith, were boldly trampled underfoot within the church and without by the high as well as the low. It was necessary both that an end be put to these evils and that in accordance with the plan suggested by Pope Urban, our religious hero, ah, they turn against the pagans with the strength formerly used in prosecuting battles amongst themselves. <sighs> yes, because we're going to fight. We can fight each other, or we can stop fighting each other and go kill some savages. Oh, it's delicious. He saw, moreover, the faith of Christendom greatly degraded by all, by the clergy as well as the laity, and the peace totally disregarded. For the princes of the land were incessantly engaged in armed strife. Now these, now those quarreling amongst themselves. He saw the goods of the land stolen from the owners, and many who were unjustly taken captive and most barbarously cast into foul prisons. He saw ransom for excessive sums. Yeah, you know who's being ransomed? Rich people. You know who's being slaughtered? Peasants, because they don't get ransomed. Oh, fie, fie. Or tormented there by the three evils, starvation, thirst, and cold, or were allowed to perish by unseen death. It's very, it's very dramatic. I'm feeling the drama. Oh. But you can see how we've got this set up. Our hero, Urban, who's gonna send us all on this religious war, and a lot of us are gonna die, but that's okay! We're saving the world! He also saw holy places violated, monasteries and villas destroyed by fire and not a little human suffering, both the divine and the human being held in derision. When he heard, too, that interior parts of Romania were held oppressed by the Turks, and that Christians were subjected to destructive and savage attacks, he was unmoved by compassionate pity, and prompted by the love of God, he crossed the Alps and came into Gaul. Gonna go that way. No. Gauls, France. Romanian, Turks, that way. There he called a council at Auvergne, where the council had been fittingly proclaimed by envoys in all directions. It is estimated that there were 310 bishops and abbots who bore the crozier. When they were assembled on the day appointed for the council, Urban, in an eloquent address full of sweetness, made it known the object of the meeting. With a plaintive voice of the afflicted church, he bewailed in a long discourse the great disturbances which, as had been mentioned above, agitated the world where faith had been undermined. There, as a supplicant, he exhorted all to resume the fullness of their faith and in good earnest to try diligently to withstand the deceits of the devil and to raise to its most pristine honor the status of the church, now most unmercifully crippled by the wicked. 
dearest brethren, he said, I, Urban, invested by the permission of God with the papal tiara and spiritual ruler over the whole world, have come here in this great crisis to you, servants of God as messengers of the divine admonition. I wish those whom I have believed good and faithful dispensers of the ministry of God to be found free from shameful dissimulation. For if there be in you any disposition or crookedness contrary to God's law, because you have lost the moderation of reason and justice, I shall earnestly endeavor to correct it at once with divine assistance. For the Lord has made you stewards over his family, that you provide it with... What? <laughs> okay. That you provide it with pleasant tasting meat in season. Clearly it's an analogy for something I know not what. You will be blessed indeed if the Lord shall find you faithful in stewardship. You shall also be called shepherds. See that you do not do the work of hirelings. Be true shepherds and have your crooks always in your hands. Closure. Sleep not, but defend everywhere the flock committed to your care. For if through your carelessness or neglect the wolf carries off a sheep, doubtless you will not only lose the reward prepared for you by our Lord, but after having first been tortured by the strokes of the lictor, you will also be savagely hurled into the abode of the damned. In the word of the gospel, ye are the salt of the earth, but it is asked, if ye fail, wherewith shall it be salted? Oh, what a salting! Indeed, you must strive by the salt of your wisdom to correct this foolish people, over eager for the pleasures of the world, lest the Lord find them insipid and rank, corrupted by crimes at the time when he wishes to speak with them. For if, because of your slothful performance of duty, he shall discover any worms in them, it's the Middle Ages, there was probably worms in most of them, that is to say any sin, ah, oh, clarity, he will in contempt order them to be cast forthwith into the abyss of uncleanness. And because you will be unable to make good to him such a loss, he will surely banish you, condemned by his judgment, from the presence of his love. This, this is the old-fashioned Catholic Church. This is that fire and brimstone. This is the shiz. But one that salteth ought to be prudent, foresighted, learned, peaceful, watchful, respectful, pious, just, fair-minded, pure. For how can the unlearned make others learned? The immodest make others modest. The unclean make others clean. How can he make peace who hates it? If anyone who has soiled hands, how can he cleanse the spots from one contaminated? For it is written, if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the pit. I guess he's the Pope. I guess he could be this annoying, but oh my God, it's annoying. Maybe it's just annoying to me. It's just like, ugh. Accordingly, First correct yourself so that, without reproach, you can then correct those under your care. If, indeed, you wish to be the friends of God, do generously what you see is pleasing to him. See to it that the affairs of the Holy Church, especially, are maintained in their rights, and simoniacal heresy in no way takes root among you. Take care lest purchasers and vendors alike, struck by the lash of the Lord, be disgracefully driven through narrow ways into utter confusion. Keep the church in all its orders entirely free from secular power. Yeah, don't let those kings get in, in there and because they think that there's cracks because 
fair unto us. I have given to God faithfully one tenth of the fruits of the earth, neither selling them or withholding them. Mm hmm. Yes, make sure everybody pays up because this is a club and it's pay to play. Whoever lays violent hands on a bishop, let him be considered excommunicated. Whoever shall seize monks or priests or nuns and their servants or pilgrims or traders and shall have despoiled them, let him be accursed. Let thieves and burners of houses and their accomplices be excommunicated from the church and accursed. Therefore, we must consider especially, as Gregory says, how great will be his punishment who steals from another if he incurs the damnation of hell who does not distribute alms from his own possessions. So it happened to the rich man in the gospel who was punished not for stealing anything from another, but because, having received wealth, he used it badly. By these evils, as I have said, dearest brethren, you have seen the world disordered for a long time, and to such a degree that in some places, in your provinces, has been reported to us, perhaps due to your weakness, in administering justice. One scarcely dares to travel for fear of being kidnapped by thieves at night or highwaymen by day, by force or by craft, at home or out of doors. Wherefore, it is well to enforce anew the truce, commonly so called, which was long ago established by our holy fathers and which I most earnestly entreat each and every one of you to observe in his diocese. But if any one, led on by pride or ambition, infringes this injunction voluntarily, let him be anathema in virtue of the authority of God and by sanction of the decrees of this council. When these and many other things were well disposed of, all those present, priests and alike, gave thanks to God and welcomed the advice of the Lord Pope Urban, assuring him with a promise of fidelity that these decrees would be well kept. So, now that he's roundly chastised his minions, we can now have some attacking of the heathens. Because, you know, you gotta whip up your troops and then go attack the other guy. As you do. Seriously. Uh, this reminds me quite a bit of uh, the murder of Beckett. It's got that Beckety feel to it. So there we go. Stay tuned. We will revisit. And this comes from the First Crusade by August C. Cray from 1921. He translated it. So yay, thank you. Long dead, Mr. Cray. Pope Urban II. Dun, dun, dun. That'll come after. Stay tuned. There's more. Not today. <laughs>